Crisis Group is unique in the sense that it is a conflict prevention organization. Crisis Group really can serve as an early warning. There is a real need for organizations that provide in-depth, nuanced analysis for decision makers on all sides of a conflict. We're trying to solve the issue at its core. You actually do something and say something that people listen to, and you can see and feel its impact on the ground. The real strength of Crisis Group is the, is the field research, is the fact that we are standing here in the conflict zones, talking to people. Is the situation getting better or getting worse? Yeah, it's getting worse. Because there are more uh, thieves, more bandits, or because there are more Taliban? Both of them, yeah. The thing that I'm learning is about security. They're telling me there are more and more Taliban checkpoints uh, across the country. What's happening is the insurgency is encroaching on government areas and starting to cut off the roads. The number of people who come through my front door and, and sit down for tea and the sheer richness of that conversation informs my reports in a way that it just simply couldn't if I wasn't here uh, in Kabul. What, what do you think he meant? If we're just talking amongst ourselves in comfortable places in Western civilization, that won't help us reach solutions. We have to be here. We have to be on the ground doing the work uh, in these places. The government has very little authority uh, across the country. Jokingly, people say that most ministers have no authority outside their own uh, ministry building. One specific instance is the closure of the oil terminals, which started in the summer of 2013. Uh, here we have a government-appointed security force called the Petroleum Protection Unit, about 10,000 men who unilaterally decided to close uh, oil terminals in the east following allegations of illegal sales of oil. And now we found ourselves in a military standoff between the government uh, that threatens the use of force against them and this group which has uh, backing in, in the east. I asked him, you know, so what were the negotiations or the contacts, the dialogue, if there was any, between him, uh, his group and, and, the, and the Libyan government in these past months? Libya is a conservative Muslim country, but it has not stopped me as a Western woman from doing my work saying their demands are more about rights than about you know, political demands. We've been able to access very controversial actors in the country simply because over time they see me as somebody who is honestly willing to listen to their grievances and have an open conversation with them without prejudgments or without preconceived ideas. There's a growth of extremism in Mombasa. We started noticing radicalization of the youth around 2011-2012 when um, Kenya went um, into Somalia and was fighting Al-Shabaab. I interviewed a number of people, all of whom were very afraid to get before the camera. Why have so many youth taken up um, the jihadist um, sort of narrative that has been spreading around, particularly in Mombasa. You know, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. And what you don't realize around, we have got uh, a higher percentage of school dropouts. Mm -hmm. They engage in uh, those talks, jihadist talks. Mm -hmm. Crisis Group tries to identify through its research conflicts that are about to happen before they happen, so it's an early warning system. And so do you feel secure in this area? No. I can't even, I cannot wish to stay more than two hours on this end. Mm. Because I don't know what will happen next. Mm. I have the opportunity to play a big role 
in early warning and prevention of conflict before it's too late. I'm here on the Turkish-Syrian border to look closely at the regime's tactics in and around the city of Aleppo, in particular the uh, tactic of depopulating rebel-held areas. The regime has employed vicious tactics, in particular using barrel bombs, which are essentially improvised explosive devices dropped from helicopters. A lot of Syrians have told us that in their families, whoever was left in northern Syria, is now coming here. We're at the Kilis bus station. Many refugees have set up camp there temporarily. There's a situation in, in which the women and children are able to sleep inside the bus garage where it's safer for them, and the men sleep outside. Okay, so the entire neighborhood came here. The town they have left is now under the control of the regime, which to them is a very dangerous development. Some are thinking of returning to Syria despite the danger that that entails. You're not an immediate aid organization. You're not there coming with bags of food or promises of an accommodation, but that you're trying to understand what they're going through so that you can find a solution. We have direct access, and we also talk to all the sides. We just, uh, you know, we don't talk just to the Iranians or just to the Europeans. We really talk to all the seven countries, and we help them bridge the gap between them. You sometimes realize that the parties are sitting at the same table, but they don't understand each other, and that's mostly because they're posturing, they're not bargaining. And that's where we come in and help them better understand what is the other side's real position. And if we don't, didn't have the access that we do, we really couldn't do that. When I attend the nuclear negotiations and I talk to non-proliferation experts from Iran or from the European Union or from the US, I need to be able to talk their language, use their lexicon. But then I go in another room, I talk to politicians, to diplomats. I have to be able to change my language, speak in Persian, speak in French, speak in English. So, you know, in a matter of a few hours, I have to wear different masks, speak different languages, take into account all the cultural nuances. Officials want to talk to us because they understand that Crisis Group is a neutral and independent organization and it doesn't pursue any political agendas. It just wants to help them bridge the gap and resolve the crisis. We have been told by high-level senior officials that some of our reports were exactly what they needed to put a floor under some of the policies that they wanted to implement. You can see the impact. The impact is felt in congressional hearings. I'm sure you've seen the uh, report from the International Crisis Group. You can see it even in the agreements where some of our recommendations are used verbatim. I recently wrote a report saying that the Afghan government should avoid implementing new rules that would essentially destroy the party system. The government quietly did avoid implementing those rules. In a chaotic, violent part of the world like this, those small changes can be really important. We've built our relations with the government and state authorities, but it's more with the armed groups and non-state actors that I feel that we've gained incredible credibility. When there are instances of local conflicts and problems, we're on the receiving end of their phone calls. It's also the type of work that would allow you to shake the world, but in a very gentle way. And that's the real added value of this work for me.